Okay. Doors closed. Thank you for all join coming here, uh, joining us today. My name is Patrick Doherty. I'm the Deputy Director of the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation. Um, my boss, Steve Clemens, um, regrets that he was unable to come today. Um, unfortunately, he's had to go and he's, part he's uh, advising one of the transition teams today um, and, uh, and then has to, has to leave for Paris in the, in the early afternoon. So I apologize that he's not able to join us, but um, his, his loss is, is my gain. Um, thanks for joining us for what promises to be a fascinating talk um, about the recent past and future of our border and immigration policy. Um, Thank you also for braving the cold uh, weather today. I should say I'm from Buffalo, uh, a snow-covered, um, snow-bound town where one quarter of America's overland trade uh, passes over the Peace Bridge. So talking about border security uh, when it's cold outside is really completely natural to me. Um, today we're here to talk with Ted Alden, um, the Schwartz Senior Fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, where he focuses on issues of U.S. competitiveness. Uh, Ted is directing the Council's Independent Task Force on U.S. Immigration Policy um, and has just published, I have a pre-publication copy here, the, the Closing of the American Border. Um, it's, you probably saw it's for sale in the back and Ted will be available for, for signing uh, after, after the Q&A section of our program. Um, he's also uh, the former Washington Bureau Chief for the Financial Times, uh, was also the Canadian Bureau Chief for the Financial Times as well. Um, my own experiences uh, with the American border are more comical, but belie uh, the tragedy that Ted writes about in his book so well. Um, as it turns out, there are at least three gentlemen uh, from the Emerald Isle who share the name Patrick Doherty um, and who reside on the terrorist watch list. Um, <laughs> the estimation to which these men are held by the U.S. government uh, is shown by the fact that the first time I was stopped coming back home, um, I believe from Israel, uh, was in the late 1990s, well before the 9-11 attacks, um, that sealed off our borders. Luckily, the officers at Dulles Airport uh, were kind enough to type in my middle initial. Um, I'm half French-Canadian, actually, um, and let me go home. Still to this day, I cannot print out my boarding pass um, from the comfort of my own home. Um, but this is minor compared to the tragedies and travesties that Ted Alden has collected and, and woven into a really incredible narrative of a nation gripped by fear um, and a massive bureaucracy trying not to get blamed for letting in the next 9-11 conspirator. Um, and beyond the tragic tale of the damage that our fear-based policy has, has really created um, on individuals, Ted looks at the damage of closing our borders has done to our economy and to our international prestige, and the picture is not pretty. Um, I will stop there and ask you to join me in welcoming Ted Alden uh, to the podium. Thanks. That's going to stay there without falling. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Patrick. And, and I didn't realize the uh, the Buffalo connection. As, as you mentioned, I, I spent several years in Toronto as the Canadian bureau chief for the FT. And actually, the last time I was in Buffalo was one of the early stories I did for the Financial Times that eventually became this book. I was interviewing Pakistanis who were congregating in homeless shelters in Buffalo because the U.S. government had put in place a program that force them to register. If you were living illegally in the United States, you were going to get deported. So a lot of them were heading to Canada, hoping to gain asylum status in Canada. So I was actually up in Buffalo in February of 2003, and it was cold. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not bad at all. Um, thank you all uh, very much uh, for coming. Um, it's funny that, you know, I've been a journalist all my life um, where your job is to, is to tell stories, hopefully good, interesting stories. Um, but since joining the Council on Foreign Relations, everybody wants to jump to the end and say, well, you know, what are your policy recommendations? What do you think the next government can, should do? Well, I'm, I'm going to make you wait a bit, um, partly because I hope you'll read the book. Uh, it's a good story, and I, I think that there is some important history here that, that people ought to know, and that was really my main motivation for writing the book. But I will, I, I will talk a bit about uh, policy relevance at the end. Um, this book came out of work that I did uh, when I was a reporter and later the bureau chief. Uh, in the Washington Bureau of the Financial Times. 9-11 was a traumatic event in all sorts of ways, but for the FT it was actually a, a, a kind of a logistically traumatic event because the FT is the, the newspaper of economic globalization and we'd been you know, very comfortable before 9-11. The, the protests at uh, the WTO were sort of the biggest story in the world and we were on 
on top of that. And then 9-11 hits, and suddenly we had to figure out, well, how are we going to reconfigure what we do in the Bureau? I was covering international trade. We didn't have anybody covering Homeland Security at the time. We didn't even have a Pentagon correspondent. And so we thought, well, what are we going to do in the aftermath of 9-11 to, to, to change the way we do our coverage? And, and we decided that it was important to look at post-9-11 stories that, that had an economic impact of some sort or another, that really kind of spoke to our core readership, which are people who are interested in economics and business. And I began taking on a lot of those stories. I wrote a lot about uh, the efforts to crack down on terror financing, because that obviously had great effect on American and European banks and others. And I gradually started to write more on Homeland Security related issues. And, and then in the, in the fall of 2002, I started to get calls from companies and others saying, we're, we're running into, into big problems on the visa front. I mean, suddenly people that we, you know, we've easily been able to get into the country, uh, we're finding their long, long delays, and sometimes they don't get visas at all, and we don't know why. We can't get anybody in the State Department to tell us. I mean, Boeing, for instance, every time they sell an aircraft to a foreign airline, they bring over the pilots for that airline to train on the new aircraft because there are you know peculiarities to, to each plane, and then and then the, that pilot crew flies the plane back to you know Singapore or China or wherever the plane is. Well, uh, suddenly Boeing found they, they couldn't get visas for the for the pilots to come in and, and do the training, and then in um, in early January 2003, I got a call from an immigration lawyer in uh, Israel who who said, you know I've got I've got grandmothers who've gone to the United States, you know, every year for the last 20 years, and suddenly I, I can't get visas for them anymore. And, and the only common thing about them was that, that a number of them had been born in Iraq. This was prior to the invasion. And he was able to deduce that, well, you know, Iraq was on the list of terror-sponsoring countries, and therefore everybody from those countries, Iraq, Iran, Syria and others was suddenly going through this extensive screening process, and so that meant that the grandmother who had you know, gone to the United States every for 20 years uh, couldn't get in anymore. Um, so as I, you know, after I came to the, 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 the Council on Foreign Relations, I, I wanted to, to go back and, and redo some of my reporting and figure out how and why we started to put in place the post-9-11 restrictions. And there are, you know, a whole series of stories I tell um, some of them uh, quite wrenching about people whose lives got, got turned upside down by these measures, and I'll, and I'll tell some of them as we go along. Um, there are two ways in which the people in the United States government made sense of 9-11 in terms of what they wanted to do afterwards uh, at, the, at the U.S. border. Um, there are two ways in which you can say that our border and visa policies were implicated in the 9-11 attacks. And those two competing explanations explain a lot about what we've done since. I mean, the core thing to remember is just the context for everything I write about in the book. The core thing to remember about our immigration rules is that they give vast and essentially unreviewable power to people who are on the front line in determining who gets into the U.S., whether we're talking about the consular officer who grants visas or the border inspector who stamps your passport and, and these days takes your fingerprint as you come into the United States. If you don't satisfy these individuals that you are who you say you are, that, that your business in the United States is legitimate, that you don't pose any kind of threat to the country, they have absolute power to turn you around and to keep you out. Furthermore, you know, as we've discovered, whether you're a foreign citizen or a U.S. citizen, they have essentially unlimited search and seizure powers at the border. You know, if they want to take your laptop when you arrive and copy everything on your laptop and keep it for the next 50 years and hand you back your laptop and do God knows what with the information on it, there's nothing you can do that prevents them from doing that. So, so at the border, our government has a vast range of powers, much greater than it has inside the country as a result of various constitutional protections. One of the legitimate criticisms of U.S. practice prior to 9-11 is that we weren't sophisticated enough in how we use these border powers to try to identify and keep out terrorists and other people who might intend to do us serious harm. And, and the best example of this was two of the hijackers, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Halid al midhar uh, a story that's told in the 9-11 Commission report and was in the, in the congressional investigations of 9-11. Both had been identified by the CIA as al-Qaeda operatives in January of 2000, but the CIA never shared this information with the FBI or the State Department. And so the names were never put on the State Department's terrorist watch list, um, which meant that when the two 
went to apply for visas in the United States, the checks were run against the, the watch list, and it had Patrick's name on it. But it didn't have Noaf al Hazmi's name and Ali al Minhar's name. And as a result, they were given visas and came to the United States and, and participated in the 9-11 attacks. <coughs> the significance of that mistake became apparent immediately on the morning of 9-11. And, and the, the stories that, that I, I tell early on in my book concerns the U.S. Customs Service. I mean, if you ask most people, who do you think it was, you know, which government agency uh, succeeded in identifying the names of the 9-11 hijackers? Everybody think, well, it was the CIA probably, or if not the CIA, the FBI. Turns out neither was the case. It was the U.S. Customs Service. And the reason the U.S. Customs Service was able to do it was this. Uh, Customs is one of those obscure American government agencies that's mostly responsible for facilitating commerce. Their job was to make sure that goods came into the U.S. in an orderly fashion, that proper tariffs were paid. But they also had a, a second mission, which was to keep out contraband of various sorts, which mostly meant keeping out smuggled drugs and, and drug smugglers. Well, before 9-11, the Customs Service had secretly entered into an agreement with the U.S. airlines uh, in which the airlines agreed to provide lists of passengers on all incoming international flights and some basic information about those passengers, you know, where the tickets were purchased, if it was a one-way ticket, if it was a credit card purchase, what the credit card number was, just some basic details. And, and Customs found this kind of information very useful in trying to help it decide who it was going to be worried about. You know, you had flights coming in every hour, thousands of people on these flights. You didn't want to pull everybody aside into secondary and question them in detail about whether they were carrying drugs. So you wanted to have some tools to try to target and say, well, you know, these people, uh, you know, that, that's a place where we see a lot of drug smugglers purchasing tickets. We ought to take a careful look at this person when they come in. Well, the interesting thing about that information was the airlines had no way to segregate the international passenger data from the domestic passenger data. So customs in effect had access, not in effect, in reality, had access to the names of every passenger on every flight, uh, either within the United States or coming into the United States every day. And so when the 9-11 attacks hit, uh, the, the acting director of the customs at the time immediately ordered them to pull the, the passenger lists for the four flights. And they began running the names. And those two names popped out, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Halid al-Midak, because by the time 9-11 had rolled around, the CIA had recognized its mistake those names had been put on the watch list. And so they, they took those two names. And they were able, using those two names and various other information about the passenger, there were a number of, of, of common credit cards that had been used by the hijackers to purchase the tickets. Some of it was just proximity and seating. You were able to think, OK, well, these guys are probably affiliated. Um, within two hours on the morning of 9-11, Customs succeeded in identifying all 19 hijackers. And they gave a list to the FBI. They said, we think these are the 19 guys. You know, we're not sure. I mean, of course, nobody knew how many, right? Could have been 25, could have been 10. We think they're 19. We think these are the guys. And they were absolutely right. And the lesson that the people inside Customs took away from that was if you could use information in a targeted fashion, coupled with the vast kind of investigative powers we have at the border, then maybe we can do this proactively rather than just retroactively that we can stop potential terrorists before they get into the country rather than afterwards. So that was the first big story that was told inside the US government of what went wrong and how to make it right in the future. But there was a second competing explanation. And it had to do, it came again out of, out of a different 9-11 story. And it concerned the hijacker Ziad Jara. Zia Jara, for those of you who remember, was the pilot of United Flight 93, which was the plane that crashed in the, in the field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, after the passengers heroically stormed the cockpit. It, it, it appears that, that that plane was headed for the US Capitol, but instead, as I say, was, was brought down by the passengers. Well, the night before 9-11, Zia Jara was pulled over in Maryland on I-95 going north, just south of the Delaware border, driving 95 miles an hour. And he was pulled over by a Maryland state trooper. And Jara hands over his driver's license, and the state trooper runs the usual wants and warrants, and, and nothing comes up. So he writes a ticket for $270 and hands it to Jara. Jara goes off the next day and ends up at the controls of 90, Flight 93. And the, and the speeding ticket was later discovered in Zia Jara's possessions that you know, he hadn't taken aboard the, aboard the plane. Well, it turns out that at the time Zia Jara was pulled over, um, he was an illegal immigrant. 
he had come to the United States on a student <laughs> visa and had never showed up at school. So he'd violated the terms of his student visa, which made him unauthorized to be in the United States. And like, in fact, about 40% of, of what we consider the current illegal immigrant population are people who've done that, who've come on legal visas, failed to, to live up to the terms of their visas and become unauthorized. And JAR wasn't the only one. It turned out that, that, that several of the other hijackers, including Muhammad Atta and Hani Hanju, or two of the other pilots, uh, had been pulled over for traffic violations at times in which they were out of status in the United States. And so the conclusion that others in the U.S. government, particularly people in the Justice Department, took away from that was, if only we could enforce our immigration laws more aggressively. If, if that cop in Maryland who pulled over Zia Jar had had at his fingertips information on who was here legally and who wasn't here legally in the country, maybe Jar would have been arrested. Maybe 9-11 never would have happened. And so these two stories, in effect, became the foundation for much of what followed after 9-11 in terms of how we have tried to tighten our border defenses against terrorist infiltration. The first group, the group who was influenced by this, this Zia Jara story, I refer to in my book as, as the cops. And, and their belief was that immigration enforcement was the crucial tool in the domestic war on terrorism. I mean, let's put aside Afghanistan and, and Iraq and what, you know, whatever else was going on on the foreign policy front. But in terms of keeping terrorists out of the United States or identifying ones that were already here and perhaps plotting to carry out attacks, immigration policy was the most powerful tool that they had. And you can see this, for instance, in the, in the, the widespread arrests of Arab and Muslim men after 9-11. After that was the subject of a big uh, report by the Justice Department's Inspector General. You had something like a thousand people who were rounded up um, for no particularly good reasons. I mean, none of them, in fact, was ever able, was ever later shown to have any connection with the terrorist attacks. But most of them were held on immigration violations, some for very, very long periods of time. There's actually a case that's going before the Supreme Court tomorrow, oral hearing start in the Supreme Court, from one of these individuals, a man named Javed Iqbal, um, who uh, was arrested on identity fraud charges after 9-11, social security fraud, which is a common thing that you do if you're living in the country illegally but you want to work, you get a fraudulent social security card. He was arrested um, and held for a year in the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn. And, and the MDC, for those of you who, you know, who haven't read about this or don't recall what you read several years ago, was, was really our domestic Guantanamo. I mean, these people were subject to horrible brutalities, you know, extremes of, of heat and cold, uh, constant beatings, uh, uh, deprived of food and other things. I mean, it was really, it was a grim experience. One of the, the stories I tell in my, in, in my book uh, concerns a young man named Benamar Banata, who is now living in Toronto, was finally granted asylum status by the Canadian government. He was held, for, he was held in MDC for about uh, eight months, subject to all the same abuses that Iqbal is complaining about to the Supreme Court now. Uh, in the end, he was held for five years on a variety of immigration charges. Um, it's worth noting that, that this was fought over bitterly in, in the U.S. government, uh, this, this decision to use immigration tools very aggressively. Um, Jim Ziegler, who was the head of the Immigration and Naturalization Service at the time, argued with Ashcroft on the night of 9-11 that this was unconstitutional and you could not do this kind of thing even in the extreme sort of situation thrown up by 9-11. But he was systematically pushed aside within the Justice Department and, and, and eventually uh, resigned. Um, at the borders, I mean, I'm talking about some of the impact domestically. At the borders, this school of thinking led to a vast expansion of screening and registration programs of, of all different types. What the people at the Justice Department originally wanted to do, um, I, I learned in the course of my research, was, was actually to have a vast registration program for every foreigner living in the United States. So if you were you know, not, an, not either a permanent resident or citizen, if you were a foreigner here on any kind of temporary status, you were going to have to register with the government. And, and the last time that was done in the United States was in, in 1940 under under the Smith Act, um, they reached a conclusion pretty quickly that they just, it was too big a project. Um, and so instead they decided to target it at citizens of uh, 
Arab and Muslim countries, um, about two dozen countries, plus North Korea, because you know, we throw North Korea into every program that we do. So um, after 9-11, what you, you had was, was two different, I mean, two kinds of screening going on simultaneously. For people outside the country who wanted to come in, if you were from any of these two dozen countries, you automatically had to go through a lengthy CIA, FBI background check before you could get back into the country. And I tell a, a whole bunch of stories in the book about some of the consequences of that. There was one, uh, one man who, uh, who is a, a researcher, he's a medical researcher from Sudan who had just come to the University of California, Davis, to do research on leishmaniasis, which is a nasty tropical disease. He just arrived with his family. At the urging of his supervisors, he went to a conference in Brazil. This was in the summer of 2002. Um, goes to conference in Brazil, spends a week there, comes back to the, to the U.S. Embassy and shows him his Sudanese passport. And as he described it to me, he said, the, uh, the officer picked it up with two fingers <laughs> and looked at it and shook his head, handed it back to me, and, and he said, you're going to have to undergo a security review. He ended up spending six months in Brazil. His family, small kids, had just arrived in Davis the week before. He was stuck in Brazil for six months, even though he'd already had a visa to come to the United States, but it was a, it was a single entry visa, which is the way it worked for Sudan. He needed a new visa. He was delayed for six months. And, and my book tells a, a whole series of these stories. Um, the, the second approach was to say, look, if all we do is use enforcement tools aggressively, we might catch some terrorists, but we're also going to inconvenience and um, harm many, many, many innocent people. And the United States has a tradition of openness. And so how can we do, how can we improve homeland security? How can we improve our defenses against terrorism in a way that doesn't inadvertently keep out thousands and hundreds of thousands and perhaps even millions of people that we want to come to this country? The experience that Customs had on 9-11 in identifying the hijackers provided a kind of model for thinking about how you could do this. I mean, the basic tool here was advanced information, that if you could get data on people as soon as possible, you could use intelligence and other targeting tools to make some judgments. They wouldn't be perfect, but you could make some judgments about who was of greater concern, who you wanted to scrutinize more carefully, and who you could let through without any real scrutiny. Um, Brian Peterman, who's a Coast Guard official who was handling these issues in the White House at the time, he said, you know, he said schemes that simply targeted everyone from Arab and Muslim countries, he said, you know, they angered these countries, and often they were allies, but they weren't particularly useful, he said, because bad people can come from what we consider good countries. So simply going after the Arab and Muslim countries, well, you know, as we discovered with Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, well, he, you know, he was, he was traveling on a British passport and people coming from, from Europe uh, didn't need visas to come to the United States. So there were people inside the government who said, look, you know, not only is, 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 is this sort of immigration enforcement approach going to be extremely disruptive, it's not going to be very effective. And so a whole series of schemes were hatched by people in the White House, and sort of institutionally, the way my book breaks down, a lot of the, the, the immigration enforcement cop types were in the Justice Department. A lot of what I call the technocrats were in the White House, the Customs Service, and later in what became the, the Department of Homeland Security. And, and these schemes included, you know, the early negotiation of what were known as the Smart Border Accords with Canada, uh, which was an effort to try to devise systems where you could, could kind of weed out the known from the unknown. Uh, the particular concern there was goods more than people, allowing goods to move freely but inspecting, you know, cargo shipments that you had some reason to be concerned about. Um, the expansion of this advanced screening of incoming passengers. I mean, one of the first things that Customs did after 9-11 was it, it went to airlines around the world and not surprisingly it started with Saudi Airlines. They said, look, you know, you're going to give us information, you're going to give us your passenger lists for every flight coming into the United States. And Saudi Airlines originally said, well, no, we're not going to do that. And so the guy who was in charge of customs at the time, Rob Bonner, he said, well, okay, every, every Saudi flight comes in the United States. We're going to pull everybody off of your flight into secondary screening, and they're going to be delayed three, four, five hours. And they did this for three days. And the Saudi said, okay, we'll, we'll give you the information. <laughs> uh, and then we went on and we negotiated it. We've negotiated it with the Europeans. The negotiations are, in fact, still ongoing because it seems we always 
are demanding more information and the Europeans are not so sure they want to give it to us. But we now have fairly comprehensive systems where we get advanced information, all flights coming in from Europe. Same is true for Canada. There are nuances to this that we can talk about and in some ways it's probably gone too far. But, but again, that was to try to use the lessons that had been learned the morning of 9-11 to expand the, 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 the web of information that would help you catch the people you were worried about. Um, I would throw into this the U.S. visit system for fingerprinting people who come to the United States. Uh, I mean, there are good things and bad things about that system, but it, it, at the very least it helps you to be certain that the people coming in are who they say they are. Increasingly we're moving towards much more secure passports and other identification documents. And one of the essentials of any kind of smart border arrangement is that you actually know that the guy who shows up at the border is who he says he is. Um, there are criticisms here, and if people want to, you know, ask questions about it, I can, I can go into this. The, the, the biggest criticisms are, are privacy ones, that there are some pretty serious invasions of, of privacy that go along with these kind of schemes, and Patrick's problem of the false positives. Um, I, I think the terrorist watch lists are a critical tool, um, but they grew exponentially after 9-11, and, and they have been a huge problem for anybody who, whose name is somehow falsely linked with these lists. Once you're on, it's almost impossible to get off. Um, So looking at, at, at what, we, what we have built overall, what we had immediately after 9-11, as I said, was a very aggressive effort to use immigration enforcement tools to keep out people we were worried about. At the same time, we had the gradual development of these smart border tools. What we saw in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 was a, a, a sharp fall off in travel to the United States. Pretty dramatic. I mean, visas between 2001 and 2003, we went from issuing about 8 million visas a year to issuing fewer than, than 5 million visas. And the effects were pretty profound on a lot of different institutions. I mean, the universities, for the, for the first time in the, in the entire post-war era, post-Second World War era, saw a decline in the number of foreign graduate students coming to the United States, even as Canada, Australia, European countries, even Japan, we're seeing their foreign student numbers grow quite dramatically. Um, businesses uh, found that they couldn't get a lot of people that they wanted here, not you know, people to work at their companies, but also potential buyers of their products. I talked to a lot of companies that said you know, they lost sales as a result of, of the post-9-11 restrictions. So there was a, a lot of this was put in place in a very heavy-handed way, kind of in 2002, 2003, 2004. From, from then, we have seen a gradual an increasingly effective effort to, to claw back some of the, the, the most heavy-handed of the measures that were put in place. And you can begin to see some, some positive results. The State Department in particular put a lot of resources into trying to speed up the visa process and uh, improve the screening process in a way so that these, that these things could operate uh, more efficiently. And we've seen in the last couple of years the foreign student numbers, which is, is one pretty good proxy for this, begin to rise um, uh, in, in a not insignificant way. And, and alongside that, um, we've had the increased improvements in these smart border uh, measures, which have generally, as I said, been less obtrusive than some of the immigration enforcement measures were. So with, sorry, I'm going to back up slightly because I've, I've um, I've jumped over uh, one portion that I just wanted to touch on quickly. Um, one of the byproducts of using immigration enforcement as your, as your tool of choice at the border is that if you look at the illegal immigration population in the United States and those trying to get into the United States, the vast majority of those are coming in from Latin America. So if enforcement is your tool of choice, inevitably you're going to hit the largest population of illegal migrants here in the United States, which is, is Mexicans and Central Americans. Um, one of the things I argue in the book is that the, uh, one of the reasons that we have seen the ramping up of, of southern border enforcement uh, to the level that we have seen in the past few years is because of the argument that somehow terrorists might be able to exploit that weakness. Um, there are a lot of reasons it's not a terribly plausible argument. We don't have on record a single case of terrorists successfully using the southern border to infiltrate the United States. But it's a powerful argument that really gripped the bureaucracies after 9-11, which was that, you know, if there, there are any parts of our border that are weak, any parts that are porous, 
these can be exploited by terrorist groups. And so, you know, what we've seen on the southern border, for instance, is a doubling of the number of Border Patrol agents since 2001. And the construction, as we know, of a whole range of physical barriers, including gradually the 700 miles of, of fence, which is about halfway uh, constructed. Um, and, um, and when you do this sort of thing, you know, you put together um, the, 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 the screening programs at the border, the physical barriers at the southern border. When you do this kind of thing, when you make people wait months for visas, when you humiliate them at airports, when you jail them for, for violations. Um, what has happened is that they've stopped coming here in the numbers that they came before 9-11. And it's also damaged America's image in the world quite profoundly. I uh, uncovered a number of documents from, from the State Department, uh, cables from foreign embassies and others, about how much damage the post-9-11 immigration and, and visa and border measures were doing to U.S. relations with countries like Bangladesh, with countries like Indonesia, with countries like Pakistan. One of the easiest interviews I had in the whole book was to get an interview with, with Colin Powell, which surprised me. I figured it would take months to arrange that. It happened almost immediately. And the reason was he remains to this day very troubled by this. He said, you know, that for, for several years, every meeting he had uh, with uh, uh, leaders or foreign ministers, particularly from Arab and Muslim countries, was dominated by this topic. And it caused him enormous problems during his time at the State Department. And he told me a number of horror stories about cases that he had to intervene on, which, uh, which I detail in the book. So going forward, I mean, we're now at the end of, of the Bush administration, um, about to start a new Democratic Obama administration. Can you sell the country on a more nuanced policy, on a policy that says, yes, we have to use tools in an intelligent and targeted way to keep out terrorists, but we have to do so in a way that doesn't undermine our history as an open country and that doesn't keep out people that we want and need for our economy and for our society. Um, people like, like Jim Loy, who was, was Ridge's, uh, Tom Ridge's deputy at, at the Department of Homeland Security, and many others who were uh, around Ridge at the time, argued for what they called a risk management approach. They said that we need to balance the costs and benefits to the United States of tougher security measures versus the costs that come from making cross-border commerce more difficult and potentially keeping out people that we want here. Um, the whole purpose of a terrorist attack is to provoke a strong reaction. And that's what happened with 9-11. The message that went down throughout the border bureaucracies, um, most of which are consolidated now in the Department of Homeland Security, was that there would be no penalty for keeping good people out of the country. But there could be severe penalties for letting the wrong people in. And so the problem that advocates of risk management have faced is that they end up in the government making these kind of nuanced arguments that, well, you know, this measure might make us somewhat safer, but we're going to pay big economic and diplomatic costs. You weigh that against this feeling in the bureaucracy that we can't be seen in any way as being responsible for letting another terrorist into the country. And it becomes an extremely hard sell, and it has been a hard sell for the last seven years. At some point, there will probably be another terrorist attack in the United States. And we can be certain that, you know, whoever was the visa officer who stamped uh, his or her visa, or whoever was the border inspector that let that person across the land borders, is going to be skewered for it. But we have to be, as we go forward, grown up about this and think carefully about the consequences of our counterterrorism measures. This is an open country. Its success, its vitality has always depended on openness. And we have to protect ourselves, but in a way that does not erode the foundations of our prosperity and security. So in terms of, you know, of specific recommendations going forward, um, you know, it's interesting to, to do this because I've, you know, I've been a journalist pretty much all of my adult life, and, and journalists are much better at spotting problems, describing them, telling stories about them than we are at solving them. Uh, if we solve them, we don't have a good story anymore. So. Um, and in some ways, 
my recommendations are modest rather than radical. I would not in any way dismantle the whole panoply of post 9-11 border initiatives because some of them are very valuable and should have been put in place a long time ago. Some of these passenger data um, uh, initiatives, the, the, the entry portion of the, of the U.S. visit system, uh, the gradual consolidations of the terrorist watch list, I think all these have, have by and large been positive developments. What I would like to see is for the next administration to stop talking about immigration and terrorism in the same breath. It's one of the many ironies of George Bush's legacy is that he was perhaps the most fervently pro-immigration president we've had in modern U.S. history, and yet he's the president who's presided over the construction of a wall on the southern border. And it was a consequence of his administration's twinning of the immigration debate with the concern over terrorism. Um, secondly, and more specifically, we desperately need to take another look at some of the programs that remain in place that target specifically people coming from Arab and Muslim countries. If you look at the overall visa numbers, they've rebounded pretty well from almost everywhere in the world. They're back up from China, they're back up from India. From most of the Arab and Muslim world, the visa numbers are just over half of the level that they were before 9-11. And that's in part because, you know, we continue to visit special humiliations on people uh, who come here from, from those countries. Um, one of the young men I write about um, in my book, and, and I haven't told you his whole story and I won't, but he's a, a um, doctor named Faiz Bora, who uh, is a pediatric heart surgeon who got kept out of the country for almost a year uh, when UCLA wanted to hire him. He'd done all his training in the United States. He works in New York now at Columbia University Hospital there. Um, he tells me every time he goes out of the country, even though he's living in the United States, He's a, but he's a young Pakistani. Every time he comes back to the country, they pull him aside into secondary. They, he's forced to hand over his wallet. They take out every piece of paper. They write down every number in his wallet. They write down all his calling card numbers. They hold him there for two hours or more, and then they send him on his way. And this happens to routinely to people coming here from, from Arab Muslim countries. And there are, it's you know, essentially a requirement currently. There are programs that remain in place that, that require border inspectors to do this kind of special screening for these people. Um, there are enough other systems in place that, that, kind of, that those kind of programs remain needless and, and, and self-destructive. And then finally, I, you know, I would think carefully about the consequences of continuing to layer on ever more levels of security. And this is where, you know, kind of risk management, cost-benefit analysis com becomes really important. I mean, a lot of us don't realize that, that you know, we did all these things after 9-11, but there were a bunch of mandates that are, are gradually continuing to be implemented. I mean, one that, that, that is happening on the, on the Canadian border right now, and it, it makes a lot of sense, but it's been incredibly difficult logistically, is the requirement that everybody who crosses that border now is going to have to have a passport or some kind of secure ID like a, you know, a special driver's license. That's going to be fully implemented in 2009. For a lot of the little border communities where they've moved back and forth freely for, for pretty much the entire history of that border. Um, a very disruptive kind of measure, and the way you do that matters a lot. We are moving now towards a full exit requirement so that everybody who comes here, you know, they're required now. Um, again, there's some exceptions. It's not, it's not fully implemented on the land borders, but if you come here on an airplane, you're required to give your fingerprints when, when you arrive so we know who you are and we know you've come to the country legitimately. We're gradually working on putting a system in place to make people give fingerprints as they leave. It's not at all clear how that's going to work. I mean, there was just a, a proposal uh, put out in the congressional record to require the airlines to do it. Well, you know, Patrick mentioned the fact that you can't print out boarding passes from home. Well, if, you know, if you're a foreigner traveling, you've got to give a fingerprint every time you come. You're not even going to be able to print out your boarding pass at the airport. You're going to have to go up the counter, do that, especially through the airline. That's another system that's coming in place. The consequences of that could be pretty profound, and it's not clear to me that the security benefits are that enormous. So to, to sum up, and, and I'd like to leave some, some time for questions, um, we have every right and indeed responsibility to use our border as a significant line of defense against terrorists. There are ways in which we can use our border that provide us levels of protection that we can't get with the laws the way they operate inside the country. But we have to be very careful and thoughtful about the way we do so. You know, the whole history of this country has been 
a history of success fueled by successive waves of immigrants, a lot of whom came here you know, not even necessarily with the intention to immigrate. They came here to study or they came here to work for periods of time and decided to make their lives here. If we make it too difficult for people to do that going forward, ultimately we're the ones who are going to pay the price. We'll gain short-term security, but we'll do it at the price of our long-term prosperity and our reputation in the world. So with that, I will stop and, and I'd be delighted to take some questions and, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Ted. That was great. Um, I'm going to go to questions in just a second, but one thing that struck me from your talk is um, uh, just a parallel uh, that I see out there um, with some, some of the debate around the FISA problem. Um, when General Hayden was at NSA, um, he, at the tail end of the Clinton administration, I believe, his agency had developed a way of balancing both the national security requirement of uh, collecting enhanced information yep. about t potential targets, uh, terrorist targets overseas, and balancing the civil liberties problem. Yep. They figured that out. They handed that into the Bush administration after 9-11 and said, hey, we can run with this. Yep. We've got this capability. Yep. But it was a political decision to, yep. to not do that. Yep. Um, and now, as you're talking about, we're, we've now kind of um, added on, kind of intermingled, commingled the immigration debate uh, which is of a, is not terrorism. It's yeah. more. It's something else, uh, um, something nastier, and, but very visceral in yeah. American politics. Yeah. And and I, what I'm wondering is, can you do you do you have a sense that we can actually do the? Do we have the ability with the proper signal, of, say, from the new Obama administration, the ability to do what Hayden did, which was to balance these two things, to to say, hey, look, let's really make sure we're we've got a good system weeding out the terrorists, but then uh, we're also proactively um, making sure that those that top talent that we really want to bring in uh, can come in um, and that you know a lot and then the, there's this third tier of making sure that we just don't trample individuals uh, civil liberties along the way um, what's your sense about whether it's a it's about a signal coming from uh, the top of the bureaucracy the White House um, as we go yeah. forward or is it more about the technical details and, and kind of the the, just the, the nasty nature of the political question about your, the zero tolerance problem. Yeah. I, you know, I think, I mean, it's both, but, but if I had to pick one, I would say it's much more about the signal that comes down from, from the top. I mean, if you take the example of, of, of the State Department, you know, and, and I have a, a whole chapter that kind of deals with the history of this in the State Department. I mean, before 9-11, the, the, the State Department visa bureaucracy, which is, you know, uh, that's a lot of what the State Department does is stamp visas around the world. And, and the mindset in the bureaucracy in the 1990s was that our job is to facilitate efficient travel to the United States, to, you know, to kind of do it with limited resource. It became one of Al Gore's reinvention of government centers. It was one of the first ones he, uh, he uh, identified was the, the State Department visa bureaucracy. And the idea was, well, what we're supposed to do as State Department consular officers is process visa applications to the United States as quickly and efficiently and pleasantly as we possibly can. And push that and, authority and, down. Yeah, and, and you know, one of, the, one of the results was, uh, of that was that they were, you know, they were incredibly lax on the security front. And then what happened post 9-11 is, is that, that the, the woman who was in charge of the, of the visa bureaucracy, Mary Ryan, uh, was fired. In fact, the only U.S. government official ever fired as a result of 9-11 was the State Department Assistant Secretary for Consular Affairs. The message completely flipped, which was that your entire responsibility now as a consular officer is to keep out would-be terrorists. Now, I think you know, we're gradually getting back to a little more balance, but the signal that comes down from the top matters a lot. And I think you know, if you've got a Secretary of State saying both matter, um, and I mean, we have, a, we have a phrasing that the, the Bush administration started to use in the last couple of years, which is secure borders, open doors. That's not a bad way to think about it. Uh, there may be other better ways to phrase it, but the idea is that both these matter. And you've got to get that message down to the bureaucracy. And, and I think that's harder, in fact, in DHS because you know, so much of the mentality in DHS is an enforcement mentality. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Border Patrol now is the largest law enforcement force in the country, dwarfs the FBI. And you've got very much of that, you know, our job is to keep out bad guys. And they define bad guys very broadly, you know, not just terrorists, but illegal immigrants and anybody else who doesn't belong here in their eyes. And that, 
I think it's going to be harder with respect to DHS to get that kind of balance and say, look, you know, like the old custom service, you have two jobs. Your jobs are, you know, to keep out bad people and bad things, but also to make the borders of the country run efficiently, smoothly, and, and you know, treat people with some kind of dignity and respect, and, and we're not there right now. Great. Okay. Well, let's, we'll open it up. Um, uh, Janine, do you want to take a first crack? Yeah. Hi. Uh, Janine Waddell, New America Foundation and George Mason University. I really appreciated your presentation. You've put together an enormous amount of material and put it on the record, and that's, that's very important. Thank you for doing that. I have a question um, um, on your one of the first points you made, which was um, that the lower level people have more, border guards have more discretion or much more discretion yeah. than they used to have. And I, I've been looking at you know the Bush years and some of the Clinton years and the increasing discretion that's been given to the bureaucracy. So I'm very curious to, to know more about that. Um, at what level do people have discretion at the border to make the decisions, and what does that depend on, and what can they decide to do? And to follow up on that, because I know Janine's looking at yeah. it too, is to what extent has the border service been using contractors? And this is one of the thing, big things that, that Janine's looking at, is oh, yeah. to what extent has that authority also been let out to contractors? Um, have we been doing that? or? or yeah. I mean, to answer that question quickly, they, I mean, they, they have not been contracting out direct border functions. But in terms of sort of the overall design and structure of programs, there's been a lot of contracting out. Right. I mean, in fact, on the on the, the sort of service immigration side, it was a big contract that just went to IBM to overhaul the entire kind of management system for citizenship and immigration services. So there's been a lot of use of contracts, but not but not you know you, you're not actually contracting out border inspection. I mean, I want I want to be clear. Actually, you know, these powers have existed for a long time. It's not that suddenly we handed border authorities a lot more discretion. It's that, that we encourage them to use the power that they've, they've had much more aggressively. Now there are, you know, there are modern issues that have to do more with, with, with things like data retention. You know, the fact that now, I mean, you've always had the power to inspect people in whatever way you can, you know, whether you want to inspect a laptop computer or, you know, their cell phone or whatever, you always had the power to do that. The problem is now you can retain these records for long periods of time. And this has been a big issue with the Europeans in the negotiations on this advanced passenger information. I mean, the amount of time that the U.S. government is going to retain this information and what sort of firewalls is it going to put around it? I mean, how do we know that that information is not going to be used for other things that have nothing to do with border security? And those are, those are difficult issues. But, but the, the powers that have existed have existed for a long time. I mean, on the, on the, the State Department front, you know, the, the principle of consular non-reviewability is a long-standing one. You know, if you get turned down for a visa, you basically have no recourse. Um, I mean, there's, you can't take it to an American court. There's really nobody who can, can, can review that judgment. And so that kind of power has existed for a long time. Quick follow-up. Just, just quick follow-up. Yeah. So, so you're saying that the, you know, the, the border guard doesn't have more discretionary powers, but that he's been given the signal that he can pretty much do what he wants and nobody's going to review it. Is that an accurate? Well, they've been given the signal to use it more aggressively, and, and you know, certainly they've, you know, they have been encouraged. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the simplest way to put it. Yeah, it's, you know, it gets back to Patrick's question about what kind of signals are coming down from the top. The signal has been sent that, you know, you're expected to use these powers in, a, in an aggressive way. Okay. Any questions in the back? Uh, Mark Esepstein with the American Cause. Um, two quick questions. Um, the first is you kind of talked about the um, difference between, I guess, inconveniencing people and punishing people. Yeah. And um, it seems that when you say hold someone uh, in a jail for one year, that is a punishment. Right. Uh, well, um, say, if someone is here illegally and you deport them, that's not legally a punishment, that's an administrative procedural. Right. So with, say, Mohammed Atta, if you just deported him, yeah. probably would have kept him from being able to do this. And um, two things which you brought up fairly briefly, which Obama does seem to be willing to scale back, is the border security uh, and a 287G program, which would allow the local police officers. So would you put those into things which really would not greatly inconvenience people who are here uh, legally. And then the second question is, do you think it's a legitimate, you talk about being open, that simply having a large 
uh, Muslim Arab population in the country uh, allows the terrorist folks to blend in and it's a group that, you know, um, that if you generally just shrink that population, that that in and of itself has, uh, can help on national security. Um, let me get too quick. Let me let me take the uh, the first question because in you know in in the immigration world the line between punishment and administrative procedure is a tremendously thin one. I mean the 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 one man I mentioned, Benamar Benata, who was held for five years. Um, the only thing he was ever charged with, and there was never any conviction on it, he was simply charged was was false ID. He had a false social security card. He was essentially held administratively. Um, because the U.S. government wanted to deport him back to Algeria. He thought if he was deported back to Algeria, he was going to get tortured. He appealed these, and they held him in jail for the entire portion of the appeal process, which ended up taking about five years, and even then wasn't completely exhausted. And when we deport people, you know, very often they're held in jail two, three, four months. So, yeah, I mean, it may be an administrative procedure. To them, it feels like punishment. I mean, you know, jail is a jail. Um, and, and, you know, some of the cases that I talk about there, you know, some are inconveniences, but, but you know, there are, are, are many others that, you know, where punishment and, and, and inconvenience become, become kind of almost indistinguishable. So, you know, I mean, one of the ways to do that, I think, is to, is to actually improve our, our you know, deportation and other procedures so that we're not holding people for the extensive periods of time that we're holding them. I mean, quickly on, on 287G, I think 287G, for, for those of you who don't know, is the, is the program that allows the Department of Homeland Security to enter into agreements with the states whereby state and local police forces can become more active in immigration law enforcement. So if they, you know, pull someone over um, for some kind of violation, they can check their immigration status. If they're found to be out of status, they can be held until the ICE agents come and take them. 287G raises the same kind of issues here because the initial idea behind 287G um, was that this would, would be essentially a law enforcement tool. That, you know, when you had people who had been engaged in criminal activity and were in the country illegally, that, that you would make sure that the local police had access to that information so they could be held and put into deportation proceedings. Um, the idea was not that simply you would use local police forces as a whole other arm of federal immigration law so that they would routinely be checking people's immigration status and turning people over to the feds. And it's been very hard to draw those lines. And, you know, 287G I think can be very useful if it means that people who've committed criminal offenses aren't let go into the United States to commit more criminal offenses. But if it becomes a kind of huge unfocused immigration enforcement tactic, it probably causes more problems than it solves, you know, because people are going to become very reluctant, you know, if you're in an immigrant community, you're going to be very reluctant to cooperate with local police for fear that somebody's going to ask you a question about your immigration status. I mean, if you're a woman who's uh, been beaten by your husband, for instance, and you know, you know, you're here out of status, are you going to report that to the cops because fear they're going to check your immigration status and then you're out of here? And so there are a lot of local police forces that, that, that don't want to participate in this for that reason. Um, quickly on the, on the question of Muslims, um, I mean, this is an argument that's, that, you know, that's made. If you have big immigrant communities, they're easy for these people to disappear in. If you look at the history of what we've seen in the U.S., though, the, the Muslim Arab community here has been a force of moderation. I mean, unlike in Europe where we, we've seen real problems with radical elements there, in the United States, um, we haven't seen that. And I think that's because We've done a better job than Europe of bringing those people in, including them in our society, assimilating them, if you were, integrating them, making them feel part of the United States. And I think that makes us safer. I don't think that makes us more vulnerable. Okay, more questions? Josh? Uh, Josh, me, I, I'm an intern here with the New America Foundation and the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institute. Great. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is you, you talked a little bit about the clawback of, of these pol uh, a clawback against these policies, if you could describe what that process looks like, is it Supreme Court cases? Is it something involving the ECLU? Uh, and second, uh, can you describe the impact of some of the bureaucratic mentality of trying to enforce these immigration policies to sort of save America? I think of um, the the terrorist attack that was just barely foiled in August of 2006, when hundreds, if not thousands, of people could end up could have ended up in the Atlantic Ocean, and we wonder what the impact of that would have been. So if you could just talk about that and whether that mentality has maybe been vindicated over time. Sorry, that mentality being? Being somewhat vindicated yeah. over time as maybe it's police measures and 
yeah. that have actually won, had any of the uh, actual winnings in the war on terror. Yeah. Um, to take the first question on, on, the, on the, the clawback, um, a lot of this happened within the U.S. government, and there are a lot of people inside the Bush administration that I give credit for this. I mean, to take um, one example, this, uh, what was known as special registration or the National Security Entry Exit Regime. This was the, the program that, you know, if you were coming here from a Muslim or Arab country, or if you were already living here, you had to register specially with the government, and then you had to actually re-register 30 days after you arrived to let them know where you were and what you were doing. And there were a lot of people that got caught out on this. I wrote a piece that ran on the Washington Post Outlook section a couple of weeks ago that tells the story of one young man named Ima Dao who was here studying computer science and failed to re-register. Um, you know, he said he, he didn't know about the requirement. A lot of people didn't know about the requirement. He was jailed for three months, deported back to Lebanon. I mean, it's a pretty unpleasant story for what was an effective administrative violation. And what happened to that program was that there were a lot of people in government who hated it who said, look, we have no evidence, and this was, you know, what the 9-11 Commission concluded, we have no evidence that this has been an effective counterterrorism tool. And we know there are a lot of injustices under it. So Tom Ridge's DHS abolished it um, about nine months after DHS was created. There's one portion of it that still remains, which is this entry portion where people from these countries are pulled aside into secondary. And there have been big fights within the government. There are a lot of people I know who would like to get rid of that portion too. But the FBI insists that they get useful intelligence from taking people's wallets and jotting down all the names and numbers. So the moment there's a stalemate. Um, state, similar, you know, I mean, state was, you know, Powell was dismayed by the impact of a lot of these programs. And so he redirected a lot more resources into the visa office, fought big battles with the FBI and others to try to speed up the security screening. So a lot of it was actually people inside the government who were dismayed by what had happened and, and, and fought internal battles to claw this stuff back. The outside pressure, intriguingly, I would have said didn't have much effect. Um, I mean, there haven't been, you know, the courts just don't want to touch this stuff. This is all seen as kind of foreign policy, national security stuff. The court cases have been ineffective. I think this case that's, going to, that's getting argued in front of the Supreme Court tomorrow, I mean, uh, Iqbal's lawyers are trying to hold Ashcroft and Mueller personally responsible for his treatment in the jail. I think the court will say no. I think, you know, I think they'll, they'll uh, recognize immunity of, of high-level government officials in this kind of case. So the courts have not yeah. been successful. We just had yeah. Martin Gelman come in and talk about Angler and the, and the role of the Office yeah. of the Vice President in um, some of the worst, egregi you know, most egregious yeah. uh, cases uh, since 9-11. To what extent do you see, I mean, you, you talked about the role you, that the, this law enforcement mentality really emanated from the Justice Department. Yeah. Um, to what extent, if any, was uh, the Office of the Vice President, David Addington, kind of involved, did you see his fingerprints in there at all, or was it really just coming out of justice? You know, intriguingly, not much. I, I kept expecting people to say, you know, well, this was, you know, uh, the VP's office was pushing for these things as well. I just think they had bigger fish to fry. I think they were, they were much more focused on, on, on the big picture of the war on terrorism as opposed to specific homeland security stuff. I mean, I did, you know, I, I, I was told a lot of stories about the ways in which Homeland Security was used politically. I mean, DHS was under tremendous pressure from day one to do dramatic things of one sort or another, exercises whenever they got, you know, various threats that they heard about to, to inflate those to the extent that they could. There was a lot of pressure from the White House to over-dramatize everything that was, was going on. But I don't think there was the same kind of hands-on role from the Vice President's office that you saw, say, in the development of, of the interrogation policies where, you know, they were working hand in glove with people in the, in the OLC and justice. You didn't see the same kind of thing on the immigration front. Any other questions? Hi, Kevin. Hi, Kevin O'Shea from the Canadian Embassy. First of all, Ted, you're, it's a great book for anyone who hasn't read it. It really reads very, very well. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, flying into Europe these days, um, you'd be quite surprised as to how few questions you're asked. Um, I remember flying into Brussels. You didn't even fill in a form. Once you were in Brussels, you were all, all the way to Bulgaria if you wanted. Yeah. Um, we've moved the exact opposite in, in terms of North America, in terms of all of these systems. Do you think the Europeans are just slow in terms of implementing that, or have we overreacted in terms of hardening the borders uh, both around North America and I'd say between, in the case of Canada and the United States, between Canada and the United States? Well, I mean, it won't, it won't surprise you to, to, to hear that I think we overreacted. I, I think um, uh, 
we over hardened in a lot of ways and we did it crudely you know we didn't we didn't think about the consequences of a lot of the measures that we were enacting some of that though I think you know comes out of the different experiences you know I mean it's a it's a funny thing that the more I watch government policy making in action the more I think that all we do every time is we respond to the last crisis and we make policy in response to the last crisis which does absolutely nothing to help us forestall the next crisis um, I mean on the in the you know take just take a couple examples on the Homeland Security Front I mean why do we take off our shoes now every time we go to the airport. Well, we take off our shoes because Richard Reed tried to light his shoes on fire. Um, why do we take all our little bottles of shampoo out and put them in a clear plastic bag and put them through and we don't carry water, bottles of water through? Because of the, you know, August 2006 transatlantic bombing plot when they were planning to use liquid explosives. So each time we kind of respond to the last. I think in the case of Europe, you know, the terrorist threat that they have faced has been a homegrown one. It, the issue there has not been people coming across the external perimeter of the EU. It's been people who are already there plotting and I think, you know, they've focused much more on that. I think a lot of their effort has gone into, in effect, domestic intelligence. Whereas because our attacks were carried out by people who came in from abroad, we've looked very much at border security measures as being the most important mechanisms. But, you know, if you had an attack, if the next attack were a homegrown one, I think, you know, you'd see a completely different set of responses that came out of the specifics of those attacks. And we'd probably overreact <laughs> ourselves in various ways, too. I, I, it, we seem to have, I, I know maybe it's just a human thing, but a very hard time getting past just responding to the last crisis. I had a fascinating conversation at the Canadian Embassy, um, actually with Kevin, uh, one night uh, a few months back. And the, the, con the uh, concept of unifying the Canadian and United States uh, uh, entry protocols uh, was, ra was raised. Yeah. Where does that stand? Um, to what extent um, is that part, could, be, could that be part of a package that deals with some of the, the, um, the, the, the more commerce-related issues between the U.S. and Canadian uh, governments? I, is that something that could, be, that, that could happen, or where, where, does that, where does that idea I mean, I think, you know, I think only at the margins, honestly. There, there, was, you know, there was talk about it in the aftermath of 9-11, but the, you know, the sovereignty considerations are, are, very, are very difficult. I mean, you know, if... If, you know, for the U.S. government to be satisfied with a kind of perimeter security arrangement, I mean, let's say for the sake of argument, that we're going to establish perimeter security and we're going to leave the U.S.-Canadian border more or less open. You know, people are going to move really freely across it. The U.S. government would have to be satisfied that the Canadians were doing basically everything the United States is doing, that we were mirroring uh, right down the line all the American security procedures. And there are a lot of reasons the Canadians are not going to want to do that. I mean, for instance, you know, does the Canadian government want to give the U.S. veto over, uh, v over its visa policy, over whether people coming from different countries need to get visas to come to Canada, or over its policy on refugees. I mean, are we going to absolutely harmonize those? Now, there has been, you know, there has been a, a certain degree of harmonization post 9-11. There's this kind of dance of, you know, how much do we harmonize at the periphery, and does that buy us some loosening at the border? But I think, you know, Kevin can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the feeling of the Canadians has been, you know, we've we've done a lot of harmonizing stuff we've tried to work closely with you we shared intelligence we've tried to cooperate at the periphery but you're continuing to harden the u.s canada border anyway so what are we getting out of this you know why should we agree to stronger periphery controls if it has no effect in terms of of, of making commerce and travel easy across the u.s canada border so i i think unfortunately there hasn't been a lot of progress you on think that that'll survive the change of administration i i don't see anything in the new administration that, that obviously portends a change in that. I mean, I see in the team Obama's bringing in a new focus on the southern border. I think things will change on the southern border. But northern border, not clear to me yet. I mean, it could make it, you know, again, this stuff gets pretty far into the bowels of bureaucracy, right? You could appoint, you know, somebody as the new Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection who's very sensitive to Canadian border concerns. I think having a governor helps, you know, because, you know, Ridge was a governor and worried a lot about the commercial aspects of this. I think Napolitano will be some of the same. Chertoff, really is a, you know, he's a law enforcement guy. That's his background. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Thanks for your, uh, for your talk. Well, you, if I you wanted could just to identify could, yourself at the oh, Paul McNeil, uh, Government Relations for Boeing. Um, uh, I want to ask you a little bit about risk management because I'm, I'm, I'm finding, you know, 
to what degree, how have you looked at it? Every time I go into it, it's a lot easier to talk about than it is to actually get into the nuts and bolts of, a, say, a modeling and simulation environment where you have to decide, for instance, on measures of effectiveness of a system. What are we guarding against? Is it threat of terror or is it uh, Im illegal economic immigrants yeah. Yeah. or is it uh, or is the measure of effectiveness how much we let through you know so it's yeah. these knobs that you have to tweak to, depending on whatever yeah. you want to put in I haven't seen the the secret magic golden key out there but um, wondered what your thoughts were on that you yeah, know I, I, I have to agree with you on that I mean the fact is it's easier to talk about risk management in theory than it is to do it in practice but the truth is, I think if we could get, if we could actually get the U.S. government to agree that, in theory, this is a good idea, that would be big progress. I mean, I know there are people in the government who use this language. There are certainly a lot of people in DHS who use this language. But you, the behavior is not consistent with that in many cases. I mean, that, that they really are... You know, they really are, in a lot of ways, trying to create something close to perfect border security. I mean, if you look at what's going on at, at the southern border, I mean, the notion is that we are going to create a system there that literally allows us to track every single person coming across the border. That we, you know, that we either know that they came through a legal port of entry, or if they didn't, if they came in illegally, we know we've tracked them using. SBI net using the system that Boeing's developing, that we're somehow we're going to be able to identify each of the individuals coming across the border somewhere in the desert so that we will, that'll give us a measure actually. You know, people, you know, when we're trying to measure how many illegal immigrants are coming across, we use this kind of weird proxy number right now. Since we don't know how many are trying, we use apprehension rates. We know how many we're arresting. We don't know how many are actually trying. And strangely enough, falling apprehension rates are seen to be a good thing because that means less, fewer people are trying. Well, the ambition here, and you know, I've, I've talked with a lot of, of CBP people, the, the ambition here is that you'll actually know the number. You know, you'll know how many tried to get across the border last year and how many we apprehended. And we'll know we lost some because we saw them on our cameras somewhere in the desert and we know we didn't get them. So we'll actually have a, a denominator as well as a numerator. I don't know whether from a risk management perspective that makes a lot of sense. I mean, is it worth putting that kind of money that kind of effort into what's essentially an illegal economic migration problem. I mean, are there better ways to deal with this? You know, comprehensive immigration reform being one, so that you, you, know, you reduce the, the pull factor a lot. And, and I think, you know, the people working inside DHS are just thinking about all of this very much in enforcement terms. How can we build an ever more secure perimeter around our country? And that, to my mind, doesn't represent risk management thinking. That represents kind of zero tolerance, tight border, we know everything thinking. Okay, any other? Yes, in the back. I just have a question. In your research. If you could just wait for the microphone because we're still on the web. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, my name is Erin Anderson. I, was, uh, I haven't had the privilege of reading your book yet, um, and I'm very impressed with your presentation, but I'm just curious if in your research did you observe any of the activity that's currently going on in Mexico? The, you mean you're talking about the, the, the drug violence and things like that? or? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I did, you know, interviews on, on both sides of the border. I mean, the, the, the drug violence situation there is, is a horrific one. And, you know, I don't want to get too far outside of, of, of my areas of expertise, but, but, you know, a lot of, to some extent, we have created at least part of the problem that exists on that border. Because as you tighten enforcement, smuggling activities of all sorts become much more lucrative. I mean, one of the reasons that Mexico is now the major route for drugs coming up to the United States is that the, the U.S. Coast Guard has become pretty successful at shutting off the sea routes in the Caribbean. I mean, a lot of drugs used to come to the United States on little boats that would land in Florida and elsewhere. Coast Guard's gotten good at cutting that off. So now much more of the flow is up through Mexico. Well, again, as we make the border tighter and tighter, there, the, the, the price of drugs goes up, and therefore the potential profit for the drug smuggling cartels goes up, and you create a bigger and bigger crime problem. I, I think on drugs, we need to, 
I mean, I'm not telling people anybody they don't know. We need to look at the demand side, right? I mean, we need to look at what's going on here in the United States that creates the enormous demand that makes smuggling so profitable, that you're never going to solve this problem through enforcement alone. And in various ways, you can exacerbate it because you, you make these cartels richer and richer and richer. Okay, great. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Um, it's now been confirmed in open source that the drug cartels are kind of hand in glove in the narco-terrorism dilemma. And we are experiencing significant inroads of Iranian activity all throughout the Caribbean. I'm sorry, um, of what activity? Of Iranian activity throughout the uh, Caribbean. Okay. So, um, you know, and the drug cartels are part of the narco terrorism issue. So it's one thing to say it's, well, the pull here in the United States because people here like to buy drugs, right. but it does fund terrorism. And so now we're experiencing, you know, this enormous. Um, homicide rate in Mexico, i.e. beheadings. And now they're having to consider experiencing the idea of IEDs and car bombings. Again, an indicator of the Iranian influence. So I think that's sort of now got crossed into the national security dilemma and the Homeland Security's concerns from a, net, from a law enforcement perspective. Before you answer, um, just a quick question about the, the source. I, I just haven't, I'm not familiar with the, with the sourcing of the Iranian linkages. Could you talk um, more about that? No, I'm sorry, I don't have it handy. I apologize. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, you hear bits and pieces. I mean, I've, you know, I've heard things about Hezbollah links along the border, and there's, there's some evidence. I don't think it's tremendously strong, but I think there is some evidence. I think, you know, again, you know, I, I dealt in my book more with movement of people than, than with the drug issue per se, but again, I think the, the basic principles hold, which is that, that you need to separate the problems out as much as you can. I mean, simply, you know, simply doing more of what we've been doing along that border and thinking that it's going to be more effective is not very likely to be a successful policy. I mean, the response to, to what you raise is people always say, well, then we've got to get even tighter on the border, right? We've got, we've got 18,000 Border Patrol agents now, maybe we need 30,000. You know, maybe we need to spend t two or three times as much money because it's not just a drug threat, it's potentially an Iranian threat. But, but the problem is that we've seen, we continue to ramp up these enforcement measures, the problem becomes worse. It doesn't get better. Now, maybe we just haven't hit the critical mass yet. But, you know, I would argue there are a lot of things that we've got to do to, to separate out kind of the conventional drug traffickers from, from ties to terrorism. And one of the ways you do that is to deal with our own demand problem, right? If you make the drug trade less lucrative, right, then, then you know, they're less attractive to, to terrorist groups who potentially see that as a source of profit, so. Okay, and I think I'm gonna close it down now. Okay. Ted's gonna be available for uh, autographs uh, of the books uh, for sale at Beck. I encourage you all to get some, and uh, just please uh, join me in thanking Ted for a great talk. Great. Thanks very much, Patrick. Thanks so much. Sure. Appreciate it.